probably covered a little bit of game theory in the economics that you would have covered in your first year. Now, game theory is a very, very wide and extensive topic. Indeed, there's a module, as I alluded to previously, an entire module that you can pick up as an option in your third year that looks only at game theory. So you can appreciate that what I'm going to give you in this just topic, this first topic, is just going to be an overview, a really, really light touch introduction to the basic concepts in game theory. Now, what is game theory? Well, in a nutshell, game theory looks at those interactions that take place between economic agents, be they individuals, firms, governments, whoever. That strategic realm of thinking, these interactions that take place between economic agents. And to introduce you to the fundamentals of game theory, I'm going to start the ball rolling by looking at a particular class of game, a particular type of game. And these games are going to be what we call static games of complete information. Now, the only reason I give you that formal title like that is if you go away to a textbook and you see something that's written like that. So, well, what is it? Well, the type of game that we're going to look at initially will be games where those parties involved and those parties involved will describe as the players. So the players within these games choose their actions or decide what they're going to do at the same time. That is, they play the game or they choose their actions simultaneously at the same point in time. So when we have games where the players choose what they want to do simultaneously, these are described as static games, as opposed to a type of game that we'll look at the week after next, will be dynamic games, where players take it in turns to make their move. But this initial foray into the area of game theory, we're only going to be looking at static games, where the players choose their actions at the same time. And also, within this class of game, we're also going to look at the scenario where the benefits or otherwise that players derive from choosing a certain course of action are known perfectly. Are known perfectly to them and to all other players within the game. That is, these are games of complete information. Now in what I'm going to give you in this topic this year, that won't make any difference whatsoever. I'm never going to show you games where players don't have complete information. So that's just a technicality that I wanted to get out of the way in case you come across it in a textbook. The important part for these games that I'm going to run through initially is that they are static. Players are choosing their actions, choosing what to do at the same time. So, with that type of game in mind, I'm now going to introduce you to a classic example. A classic game which I'm sure you've all seen before. And that is the example of the prisoner's dilemma. <clears throat> now, the prisoner's dilemma covers a whole multitude of games. And there are lots and lots of different examples I could give you, but the structure of the game would be precisely the same. So I'm going to give you a very, very specific example, which quite literally does relate to prisoners. And in this example that I'm going to work with, there are two suspects. And these suspects have been arrested by the police. And the police believe that they've committed a crime. The problem is, though, the police don't possess enough information 
to convict these suspects. <coughs> they think they've committed the crime, but they cannot prove it. In order to get a conviction, what the police need is for one, at least one, of these suspects to provide a confession. So the problem is, what do the police do? How do they elicit this confession from at least one of these prisoners? So what they do, they arrest the suspects, they bring them into the police station, and they interview them in separate rooms. And they tell them the outcomes that will happen, dependent upon what the prisoners choose to do. And prisoners, the suspects choose to do. Now these suspects can only do one of two things. They can either confess to the crime, or they can completely deny involvement. However, one small word, if you remember it, will make all the difference for this example. When the suspects either confess or deny, they do not say, I confess. They do not say, I committed the crime. They do not say, I did commit the crime. What they say is, we committed the crime or we did not commit the crime. So it's not an individual confession, it's a confession that the two suspects did or did not commit the crime. And in order to get a conviction, the police need at least one of the suspects to provide that confession. So, the police take them, and they interview them in separate rooms. The choices for the suspects, they either deny or confess. But the police explain what the consequences of their actions are. And if they neither of the subject, if neither of the suspects confess, they will both be sentenced to one month in jail. Now remember, the police require a confession to sentence them. Well, if neither provide a confession, that is, if they both deny, the police don't have the confession that they need, they can't convict them for the crime for which they've been arrested, and so they convict them of some minor, minor charge. And for that, they will spend one month in prison apiece. So that's if both of them deny involvement in the crime. However, if both of the suspects confess, if they both say, hands up, we admit it, we committed this crime, remember, we committed this crime, if they both do that, the police have the confessions that they needed. They only needed one confession, and they've got two. That's enough to convict both of the prisoners. And they will be convicted to six months in prison. So that's if they both confess to the crime. So we know what happens if they both deny. We know what happens if they both confess. But what about one confesses and one denies? And if, in an exam, more importantly, students make a mistake, it's this particular part that causes confusion. The students get it the wrong way round. So, listen carefully, and really get clear for yourselves what the nature of these incentives are. So if one confesses, whilst the other denies. So the police will have the confession that they require. That's the most important thing. So therefore, someone is going to get sentenced. If one police, if one suspect provides the confession to the police, that suspect who provides the confession gets off scot-free. They are released with no time in prison. So remember what I said at the beginning? What's the nature of the confession? The confession isn't, I did it. The confession is, 
we did it. So the person who provides the confession has implicated his quote-unquote friend. The police now have the confession that they needed, and the person who provides that confession is let off by the police with no time in prison whatsoever because they've helped the police with their inquiries. So that person gets zero months in prison. However, the other person, the one who adamantly denied involvement in the crime, no, no, we didn't commit this crime, the police say, well, yes, you did, you've now got the confession, we'll punish you to the full extent of the law. And that person gets sent to jail for nine months, even longer than they would have happened if they both confessed. So that's the absolute maximum amount of time that they could be convicted. So that then is a very simple thing. Do you deny or confess? Get it though the right way round. If you confess whilst the other person denies, you get zero months in prison. It's the one who continues to deny gets the longer sentence. So, that's our okay, game. That's the prisoner's dilemma. So rather than writing it in word form, we can represent it in this very simple matrix that encapsulates everything <coughs> that we've just said. And this matrix that I've drawn out is a very, very specific way that games are represented in game theory. And that matrix formulation is called the normal form representation. And that matrix describes exactly that game that I've just described of the prisoner's dilemma. Unlike any game described in its normal form, it will capture three basic principles. They are, firstly, the players involved. Now, our players, these economic agents who are playing this game, are suspect one and suspect two. So those are the players. We will also, in normal form, show the strategies available to the players, what choices they can take. And for both of the players, their choices were either to deny or confess. Deny or confess. And then lastly, the rest of the information are the payoffs that players receive from various combinations of the strategies that the players can choose. So given that we've got two players choosing two strategies, there are four <coughs> possible combinations. So here in the top left is where they both deny. Here in the bottom right, for example, is where they both confess. And the numbers represent the payoffs to these strategy combinations. So for example, we said previously, if both of the suspects chose to deny, the police wouldn't have the confession that they required. Therefore, both players were sentenced to one month in jail. And hence, that's what these figures correspond to. Both suspects get one month in jail. Now, to denote the fact that players would rather have less time in prison than more, I've just put that minus sign in front, just to emphasize that more months in prison is a detrimental thing. Now, the fact that this is symmetrical means that both players get exactly the same time, one month in prison each. <clears throat> but, by convention, the way that we represent these payoffs in its normal form, the first <coughs> figure would be the payoff to the role player, that is, suspect one. The second figure will be the payoff to the column player, in this case, suspect two. So, for example, if they both confess, they will both get six months in prison. If, though, suspect one confesses, 
at the same time a suspect to denounce. The payoffs would be zero months in prison for suspect one and nine months in prison for suspect two. And just to reinforce that, this is in the bottom left hand corner, suspect, suspect one provides a confession. He's helped the police with their inquiries. He gets away scot-free. He gets zero months in prison. Suspect two, though, because he chose to deny, then gets sentenced to the full nine months in jail. And top right there, if suspect one denies and suspect two confesses, suspect one will get nine months in prison, suspect two gets off. So that is just a way of encapsulating, describing in that matrix form the game that we set up previously. So that then is the normal form representation of our prisoner's <coughs> dilemma. Now, it's pointless setting up any game if we can't say something about the likely outcome. So as we've set it at the moment, there could be four possible outcomes. There are four possible combinations where they both confess, or they both deny, or where one confesses and the other denies. So we could be in either of these four boxes. The question is, which box do we arrive at? What's the most likely outcome? Now the whole point about game theory, if, it's not like if you're doing, for example, micro theory with a demand curve and a supply curve. Where these intersect, there's a definitive <coughs> equilibrium. Absolutely, this will be the market price. That's the market equilibrium quantity traded. It's a very, very precise outcome. In game theory, we might talk about equilibrium outcomes, but it's not an equilibrium in the same way. We're talking about individuals and how they behave and what they choose to do. We're bordering upon the realms of behavioural economics. We're bordering on the realms of psychology. Therefore, the outcomes, even though we might describe them as an equilibrium outcome, are more correctly described as more plausible outcomes. But even though I'll bandy the term around equilibrium in lectures, that's what I'm referring to. Of these four outcomes, which one is the most likely? Which one is the most plausible? Rather introducing you to any theory whatsoever. Absolutely nothing, just something really, really obvious. Something really, really plausible. We can say that a rational player, that is we behave in a logical, a rational way. Remember the suspects, you and me, we're the players. So if we're rational players, what will we not choose to do? Well, we wouldn't play a strictly dominated strategy. Now, the question is, what is a strictly dominated strategy? Well, a strictly dominated strategy is a strategy that always gives a worse payoff. So when you would have studied consumer theory in your first year, We've done difference curves, budget constraints, and we're going to return to this in our topic two. But when you've studied this already, what was one of the central tenets of that theory of consumer choice? That individuals make their choices. They choose bundles of goods such as they maximise their well-being. They choose <coughs> outcomes that make them off, that make them as well off as possible, and that is the principle we're referring to here. Individuals don't choose to do something if it always makes them worse off. That is what a strictly dominated strategy is. A strategy for which an alternative always, always gives a better payoff. So, let's look at that game. Let's just look at it for suspect one. And suspect one would think, well, okay, there are two things I can do. I can deny involvement in the crime, or I can confess. Which one of these would I choose? Well, again, it goes back to that point I said to you. It doesn't matter what I do, it also depends 
what you arrive with is. So suspect one will reason through it like this. Suspect one will say, well, if my rival chooses to deny, what payoffs do I get? How long will I spend in prison? Well, if suspect two chooses to deny, if suspect one also denies, he will get one month in prison. But if suspect two, two choosing to deny, if suspect one confesses, he gets not one month in prison, but zero. So, if that were you, if you were making this choice, what would you rather? To spend one month in prison, or zero months in prison? Obvious, the rational choice is to choose to confess and spend zero months in prison. So, in terms of what we said about a strictly dominated strategy, we would say that deny is strictly, well, we, we would say, oh, sorry, I'll re-edit that out because you're not seamless. We would say that in this sense, it would be optimal to choose to confess. Well, what would happen if rather than choosing to deny, suspect two chose to confess? Again, suspect one <coughs> would argue through the same sort of logic. That if your rival is going to confess, do you want to spend nine months in prison if you choose to deny, or spend six months in prison if you choose to confess? Now, neither of those is particularly attractive, but given the choice of six months in prison or nine months in prison, suspect one would much rather the lower sentence of six. So he would choose to confess again. So both scenarios, it does not matter what suspect two chooses to do. The optimal thing, the best thing that the other suspect can do is choose to confess. Confess always gives a better payoff. Or back to our definition here, we would say that deny is strictly dominated by confess. So you always find it optimal to confess. And what did we say a rational player won't do? will never choose to play a strictly dominated strategy. And are either of those strategies strictly dominated? Yes. Deny is strictly dominated by confess. And a very, very basic puzzle. It doesn't matter what player what suspect two does, player one, suspect one, always gets a lower sentence by choosing to confess. And indeed, I guess that's the sort of logic that two-thirds of you went through when you also chose to confess. In all instances, you get a better payoff, a lower prison sentence by confessing. And under this game, they have talked about deny being strictly dominated by confess. But when we've only got two strategies, if one strictly dominates the other, we would also describe that, therefore, as being a dominant strategy. So in this game, the option to choose to confess is described as a dominant strategy. Now, a dominant strategy is just a strategy that always gives the highest payoff, regardless of the choice of the other player. So that is a dominant strategy. So here, we've only got two things, deny or confess. <coughs> one of these strictly dominates the other. That one that strictly dominates would be a dominant strategy, a strategy that you always choose to play. And so, going back, if I had played this game, what would I have chosen to do? I would have done exactly the same as two-thirds of you. The logical choice is that I would confess. It makes no difference what you choose to do. If you choose to deny, I will confess. If you choose to confess, I will confess. Two-thirds of you did it, that's what I would do. And so, of all of the possible outcomes, 
that we see in this game, of those four possible outcomes, we end up with a situation where we both choose to confess. And hence, that is the most plausible outcome of the game. That's the equilibrium in this game, where we both end up spending six months in prison. Does that, though, does that, though, strike you as a little bit strange? And I guess this is why it's called the prisoner's dilemma. You think, what works for me in this game? What works for me is always choose to confess. I'm going to provide the police with their confession. And why do you do that? If only these players could agree. They could agree beforehand. Absolutely. Don't provide the police with their confession. If I said to you, before we go, the police are going to arrest us. They're going to take us in different rooms. <coughs> this is what they're going to do. If we agree to deny involvement, just don't give the confession. If we do that, we'll both get only one month in prison. <coughs> so let's say before the police arrived, I gave you that promise. I absolutely swear to you, I'm going to deny him in the crime. I'm not going to confess. Hand on heart, that's what I'm going to do. Quick show of hands then. Who would also deny? Well, none of you. They'll mark you down for your exams. Okay? But that's it. That is exactly it. This is the dilemma. That's what's the prisoner's dilemma. If they could agree beforehand to deny involvement in public, if they could agree to cooperate, they would both only get one month in prison. But why don't they? Because you can't trust the other player. And even if you did trust the other player, it makes no difference. Because if the other player is going to deny, should you also deny? No. The best thing that you can do is confess. And it's worse than that. Not only do you know it, but the other player knows it as well. The incentive that you have to confess is known by the other player. So absolutely, there's no way in this game, plausibly, we can have any other outcome apart from this one here, where both players end up confessing.